name's Randy Button, and I'm going to be the moderator here today. I try to keep every, all the trains on time, uh, keep everybody moving. Don't ask me any questions because I don't know any information. Uh, please ask all the, uh, the very valued speakers that we have here. We've got a great lineup for you. Um, we've got some people that are going to be talking about what we face in the real estate market as well as some legal aspects as well as people from the financial side. Um, I know there's a lot of uncertainty in the market right now, and a lot of volatility we see in capital markets as well as real estate markets, but uh, hopefully we'll get everything solved here today and we'll leave and we'll go out and we'll uh, get everything cranked back up and have a great 2023. This is the first time we've done this since uh, 2018 here at Top Golf. Uh, we want to make this an annual event when we did 2018. I see a lot of faces that were here on our first annual. We wanted to make it an annual. Second year we did with the banking, uh, with the Tennessee Bankers Association, we did along with the banking seminar. I know a lot of you attended that. And then we had two years of something called COVID that uh, set us back and none of us wanted to meet or be in the same room together. So this is the first time we're back. Thank you all, it's a great crowd. We've, uh, we've got about 130 folks here, which is phenomenal for something like this. Uh, and people from all over the state. We're going to begin, so I'll tell you a little bit of the layout. We're going to do two one-hour sessions this morning uh, before break, and then do one more uh, late morning. We'll have lunch. Lunch will be served here um, around noon, and then we'll rinse and repeat and do the same thing in the afternoon. Um, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our first speaker and get him started because I don't want to get this thing off uh, on a bad start to get us behind. Our first speaker here this morning is uh, Ronnie Phillips. Ronnie is a uh, principal advisor of Real Star Realty Advisors. He and I were speaking here earlier. He's got a really interesting background. He actually grew up in uh, right outside of Knoxville. So he's another East Tennessee guy like myself. Uh, went to California, has been in Houston. He's done work all over the country. Uh, has now moved back uh, to East Tennessee. And uh, with that, I'm gonna let uh, Ronnie take over and you can hit the mic and you should be good to go. Well, join me in welcoming Ronnie. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a privilege. It's a privilege for me to be here and speak for MAI appraisers. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Clayton Hale. He's the shepherd of your chapter here. And uh, if we could give him a quick hand. Can't, can't hear him. Uh, the other uh, irreplaceable and uh, person that we want to thank is Myra Pitts. Myra Withers Pitts. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. She has worked tirelessly for you and your chapter to make this event uh, what it's going to be, and look at the turnout. It's so uh, wonderful. Um, what can I say to the governors of real estate? There's more credentials and experience in here. Well, you all could uh, appraise every parcel of uh, real estate in the uh, state of Tennessee and beyond. So the best I can do is just try to share a little bit of my experience. That's the best I can do for you. Um, what we're going to talk about today is the real estate market cycle. So let's look behind curtain number three here. Are we going to have an imminent recession or extended expansion? That's the big question. Um, before we determine if we're going to have that or not, we have to look in the past. Real estate is the only business that I know where you have to look in the rearview mirror to see where we're going. Hear me good over there? Okay, super. So we spend a lot of time looking at, at past data, secondary data, all that information to help guide us to provide excellent advisory for the people who have confidence in us to provide advisory services. So let's move on here to my favorite topic in the world, real estate market cycle. 
there is in fact a real estate market cycle and it does have six distinct phases. Now the general public believes that the recession is the end of the cycle. For real estate investors like myself, this is the time to buy. This is when you want to have your powder dry and you want to go long. But from the recession, we go into the recovery, into expansion, and finally into the boom stage. And once we get to the top of that roller coaster ride, it's going to go on that long ride down to the bottom through the contraction, and it's going to start back at the recession. Now this cycle is just like the sun. It's going to come up tomorrow. And the waves are going to come in and they're going to go back out. And this beautiful fall scenery that we have out here in, in Tennessee, it's going to turn to the chill of winter very soon. The real estate market cycle is exactly the same way. You can't time it with that exact regularity, but understanding where we are in the phase of the cycle will definitely tell you what your strategy must be in the next phase of the cycle to prosper. So this is all we're going to talk about. So we have to start back here. So please trip back in time with me and let's go into the past before we can get to the future. My slides in order. All right, 1990-91 was the last big recession at that time. Now, I, at this point in time, I did not understand or know anything about the cycle. I was just managing properties, trying to build my portfolio, very concerned with what's happening on my block, on my properties. That's all I was concerned about. Hey, I couldn't care less what the macro economy is doing. If my properties are kicking out that NOI, I'm, I don't have to worry about much else. However, as we get rolling, in 1998, something very concerning happened. Lenders started shunning the borrowers that they had previously, you know, said, hey, no thanks. No, no, no. They were like, hey, we got a loan for you. Come on down. And so they started selling heavily into the secondary market. Commercial mortgage-backed securities, residential mortgage-backed securities. That business really got cranked up right here. And that was a concern to me because real estate is historically a private business. If you all want to know, find out what's going on on a property, you've got to do some due diligence, you know. It's not up on, uh, you know, it's not, not up on the web. It's not up on, uh, you know, easy to see media. Now, in 1999, the, the dot-com started really booming. But what really concerned me the most was the repeal of Glass-Steagall. Now, I must confess, at that, at that time, I didn't understand the full ramifications of it. But the repeal of Glass-Steagall which had worked very, very, very effectively since the dark days of the Great Depression, held the banking industry in check. Well, with the Clinton administration, with a stroke of a pen, says, hey, we're in the new economy. Dot-com's gone. We don't need all that old stuff. We're, this is the new paradigm, the new economy. So let's just get rid of that. Gone. So when it, in less than a decade, we had the biggest boom and bust, all because of free capital, cheap capital, flowing into all core real estate assets. All right, so finally, dot-com did bust, and when Wall Street realized, my dog has fleas, dot-com, is not going to earn one dollar of revenue. They pulled the carpet out from under them. And you had a lot of paper millionaires back living in their parents' garage 
with tax bills that they could not pay off. All right, so let's look at what's happening next. <coughs> Full-blown boom phase. Now, every expansion always ends in a boom phase. That's where you have to be very careful. When it transitions or abruptly shifts from a healthy expansion into a, a full-blown boom. Now, does anybody remember what happened in 2002? A couple things. You may remember one, but not the other. Anybody remember that far back? 2002? 2002, mortgage interest rates went to a 45-year low. 45-year low. And the other thing that happened was all my tenants said, hey, landlord, you know where to go because it's cheaper to buy a house than it is to continue to pay you rent. So sayonara. <clears throat> So while the world is throwing money hand over fist at real estate, I'm waking up in the middle of the night going, how am I going to pay all these mortgages <laughs> with no tenants, right? So while everybody's ebullient about the wonderful real estate market, I'm struggling to make sure my mortgages are paid on time, no matter what I had to do. So... What's happened after that? Didn't the federal funds rate stay at about 1% for an entire year? 1%? Absolutely, 1%. That meant for anybody loaning money out, that's free money. I'll go to the Fed window, get my 1%, take that, package it up into a pool of loans, sell it into the secondary market, get my fee back, keep that dice rolling. That was a wonderful business model until it all imploded in 2007. Now, I was telling you what really concerned me, but what really, really concerned me was what I call skydiving cap rates. Now, I had never experienced this in my real estate career before. And you can go back and study cap rates all the way back to 1978. And if you look at cap rates from that period of time, up until 2001, you'll see very, very clearly that they traded in a very tight range. They didn't change. In other words, you could go back. So if you look at capitalization rates in this 2001 period, you could go all the way back to 1978. And they traded in this very tight range. They didn't go up. They didn't go down. They just stayed there. Hey, I want to buy an industrial building. I'll get 10% all day long, no questions asked, right? 2002, <laughs> wow. This isn't any type of normal movement. This is what I term a skydive. Now, if you look at this clear, very clearly, is this not I over R equals V? Isn't that exactly what we're looking at? But what we're looking at is values and price becoming uncoupled. In a normal equilibrium market, price, price and value are so tightly wrapped up together, you can't separate it but they absolutely became uncoupled here. So this told me in 2002, hey, we are in a boom. It's no longer about rational valuation. That goes out the window in 2002. 
Now, this is a geometric increase in value, and cap rates are plummeting. The only thing missing here, what component are we missing? Any appraisers in the room? <laughs> Anybody know anything about NOI? <laughs> the only thing missing here is NOI. NOI moves in an incremental manner, uh, right? Because those are leases. Those are rents. I can't go to my tenant and say, hey, real estate values are soaring. I need X amount of dollars extra per month. Number one, they're going to tell you where to go. The other is that, hey, we have a lease agreement, and I'm going to pay you exactly what the lease agreement says. No more, no less. So this is an incremental movement, while this is a, a geometric movement. So this told me people during this phase of the cycle are paying a premium, an astronomical premium, to gain or obtain roughly the same amount of NOI that you could collect in 2001 because that's an incremental growth and this is a geometric growth. We could spend the rest of the day right here. <laughs> Any questions on that? No? Okay. Is this hitting home? No. All right. Let me see if I'm doing that correctly now. This is another look at it. Skydiving cap rates. That's just an incredible movement. Industrial, retail, mall, suburb, central business district, apartments. You see that the apartments drop the most because, you know, most people can understand a gross lease. It takes another level of acumen to understand uh, a retail lease or industrial or even in, invest in those kind of properties. So that's just another look at, at what we just looked at. Look at the volume, volume flowing into real estate assets over a 12 month period. Now understand that's what they be. I can't count that high. 39%, 22%, 80% increase over a 12-month period, 72%. All these things told me from my <laughs> sidelines, hey, we're in a, a massive boom. A massive, massive boom. And real, real estate valuation metrics no longer make any sense. That's just out the window. It just told me that people were living in Bubble City. And anytime you, see, I remember seeing this on the bookshelf at either Barnes or Noble or Borders. They're consolidating, not many bookstores left. But anyway, I, I looked at this title and I kind of chuckled to myself. Oh yeah, <laughs> jump right on in, the water's fine. When a publication like that tells you that, hey, how come you're not getting rich in real estate? The party's over. The punch bowl has been removed. You just hadn't, hadn't found out about it yet. <clears throat> so <clears throat> General Patton says, when everybody's thinking alike, nobody's thinking at all. And that's what I experienced during that period of time. Now, <clears throat> I couldn't, made a, couldn't have made a textbook to make this any more <laughs> graphically clear to exactly what was, what was going on. Lockstep capitalization rates plummeting and value of real estate soaring. Just, just amazing. I mean, it's, it's, just, uh, it's just amazing. Look at the volume that's flowing into real, all, it's all core real estate assets. And it's not, you know, retail or office. It's every sector, every sector. So um, I'm a real estate investor. Number one, I'm a real estate investor. Number two, I'm a real estate investor. Number three, number four, number five, number six, I'm a real estate investor. I couldn't play that game. 
What do you think my strategy was during that period of time? Any ideas? Sell. Pardon me? Sell. Sell? Sell some of your properties. Well, if I'd sold my properties, I would have been left with a, a fistful of cash. And a fistful of cash is just like a fistful of sand. <laughs> right? Real estate equity will hang together. Right? I want my cash or money in real estate assets. But because I couldn't play the game and I didn't want to sell, I knew that the cycle would come back around. If, if you're not in the market, if you're not buying and selling and you're just holding properties, you, you, know, you don't care if the cycle's up, cycle's down, sideways. Right? Especially if you're getting uh, NOI and you're collecting rent. Hey, I couldn't care less where the market's going. But my personal strategy was, and I told everybody I know, listen, do not buy real estate. Buy yourself an art collection. <laughs> Go around the world. Travel. I went to all these places because real estate was a losing game at that moment. So I just kept on traveling. Hey, real estate comes back around, it'll be all right, you know. I like the Champs Elysees. Sydney, Stonehenge. I had my head was down in real estate for so long when I looked up, hey, I need to figure something else out. So let's uh, let's travel. Now in the fall of 2005, I get invited to go lecture at a, a college, an accredited college in Silicon Valley. And uh, I'm telling all of my students, listen, listen students. And most of my students were engineers at Google, Facebook, PhD, Stanford, software engineers. They're sitting in my evening real estate classes wanting to know about real estate. Listen classes, real estate is gonna reach a saturation point. I don't know when. I've been talking about it so long. <laughs> I don't know if it, the, the top's ever gonna come. But when it reaches the saturation point, real estate values are not only gonna decline across the United States, they're going to decline here in Silicon Valley. What do you think they told me? You better go back to wherever you came from. Because real estate values never decline in Silicon Valley. Well, six, eight months later, they're all clamoring. How did you know? How did you know? I watch the real estate market cycle. Every decision I make about real estate, the first step is not, hey, I'm gonna go value the property and see if I wanna buy it. Where are we in the real estate market cycle? Is that conducive to me accumulating more lifetime equity or getting my equity depleted? Like so many people found out the hard way. Top of the cycle for residential was 2006, and commercial always lags behind residential, correct? So the top of the market was 2007. Any questions or comments about what we've talked about so far? Okay. Usually the contraction phase is where liquidity is steadily <laughs> removed from the market. And all those people who bought in those skydiving cap rates, they were expecting the lender to step up and say, yeah, hey, we'll bail you out with refinancing. There was no liquidity in the market. Capital markets were frozen. So usually the contraction phase is a, a transitory uh, phase. But in this particular situation, oh no, it went straight 
from boom to recession. I mean, it went straight to recession. The contraction, 2008, well, that was a difficult, difficult year for everybody on earth, wasn't it? So we went from the contraction right down to the bottom. Now, a, a friend of mine who went through the Texas A&M Real Estate Land Economics and Real Estate Program with me was working at AIG at the downtown Houston office. Hey, Ronnie, all these investors have written all these insurance contracts betting that the housing market is going to collapse. <laughs> well, when it did, what do you think happened? Investors knocking on the door. Put the money in our hand. I've lost my show here. <laughs> Uh-oh. I'm going to have to wing it from here on. <laughs> anyway, the fact is, the investors came and said, put the money in our hand. You think they had the money? No, no. We ain't got no vault full of money. We just sold you some paper. So guess what happened? They had to go to the lender of last resort. And who's that? The American taxpayer. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, Randy. Sorry to be such a trouble. So invest investors came calling. And it was the too big to fail, wasn't it? A lot of people got bailed out that shouldn't have got bailed out, but they got bailed out anyway by the taxpayer. Now, in 2009, housing starts fell below the one million demarcation line. So builders were like, hey, housing starts have fallen below one million. We'll be tearing up the ground next year. That demand never, ever materialized, did it? capital markets were still frozen. 2010 was the height of the foreclosures. And <clears throat> what I neglected to tell you that back during the boom, when I went to California, I was approached by many people who purported that they had seven figures ready to invest. Hey, we hear you're the guy, let's get some real estate. No, it's not time. What do you mean it's not time? We have to buy before prices get higher. <laughs> no, you don't understand that when the market reaches a saturation point, the bottom's going to fall out. Now, give me your name and number and information, and I'll call you when it's time to go. 2010, I'm living in Silicon Valley, and I'm looking at properties in Houston, Texas. Hey. I found some property. You ready to go? I got two and I got two answers. What do you think those answers were? Oh, we don't have the money now. <laughs> or we already bought and now we're upside down. Well, I told you so. <laughs> you know, you just you can't tell, right? You know, you all are experts. I mean the top of your field. You all are the governors of real estate. Will people not listen to you sometimes? They have this arrogance that I know better. <laughs> you know, and you've been around the block. You've been through the cycle. You've been drugged through the cycle. And you try to impart your wisdom to people. And th they have an arrogant attitude, like they mo know more than you. 2010, I was invited to uh, the Berkeley um, big real estate conference. And they asked me what was my opinion about when the housing market would recover. Well, it's recorded on the radio, but I said, I know this is bad news. Real estate is not going to, on a national basis, housing is not going to recover till 2020. Do you think you might want to hear that in 2010, that it's not going to recover till 2020? That taught me that economic reality is just like a tennis ball. 
the harder I throw it against that wall there, it's going to come back at me at exactly the same velocity. Economic reality is exactly the same. So I said, hey, look, 2020. I stood behind that because that boom was so massive that it had to go further and it would take very, very long period of time before it actually did recover. We'll see when it did recover, but any questions on that or any comments? I don't want to leave y'all out now. I'm on the trip here. I kept waiting and waiting for the bottom of the cycle. When's the bottom going to come? When's it going to happen? When can I go in? When can I buy? 2013 through 15. If you weren't advising your clients to buy property at that time, or you weren't buying properties for your own portfolio, I'm sorry. You missed a once in a lifetime to grab real estate equity for pennies. I mean pennies on the dollar. It's not, oh, below replacement costs. It's giveaway prices. I was buying properties at the county tax sale. They were giving properties away. Went there to, to an auction. The auditorium had about this many people in it, and me and two other people bidding. I'm like, why are all these people here? <laughs> Spectator sport? Get some properties. So that, that period of time, you know, all, all the time it was booming, I was locked out of the market. I couldn't play. And I was saying to myself, how can this be happening to me? I've burnt all the bridges to be successful in real estate, and now I can't play in, in the market? Then, when this phase of the cycle comes along, I'm like, how could this be happening? <laughs> Properties are falling in my lap. By 2016, it was all over. So, real estate on a housing, you know, didn't recover in 2020, it recovered in 2016. Now, how do I know that? Because I went to the last auction in 2016. There was a 20 unit apartment complex that I wanted. This building had no plumbing, no wiring, condemned by the fire department, boarded up, graffiti everywhere. It would have been a great investment. Every time I went to bid, 1,000. The people who got it, five, 1,000, five, five, five. I didn't give it to them, they had darn it. <laughs> but they, they got it and I didn't. A gentleman who I'd got very friendly with at some earlier sales who bought properties too, he said, Ronnie, you couldn't have got that property. Those people are ultra wealthy. You know, you're just rich. They're wealthy. There's a whole, whole different category. So that told me, hey, it's over. This slump and all this period is over. We are into recovery now, and we're going to continue on. Let me get this right. Now, as I said, real estate is the only business where we have to look in the rearview mirror to see where we're going. So looking in the history here, I did in fact catch the bottom of the cycle, 2013 through 15. And 2016, it's, it was all over. Now, one thing that I can say about that is that it taught me the real lesson that real estate values are only undervalued or overvalued for relatively short periods of time before they return to long run equilibrium pricing. Right? Only seven, eight years of undervalue or overvalue before they return to long run equilibrium pricing. And I said at that time, you know, hey, Kat, I wrote an article in 2012, uh, Myra can get it for you if you'd like it. 2012, capitalization rates have to rise 
because prices must return to long-run equilibrium price. It's just economic reality. However, the recovery, it has been by all measures, by all estimations, all understanding, the slowest economic recovery since World War II days. So how will the longest recovery in U.S. history end? Anybody have an idea how it may end? Repeat the cycle. Absolutely, you are correct. We have to repeat the cycle. But hey, 2020, the housing market could crash, right? According to Professor Schiller. Now, when someone is excellent at compiling reams and reams of secondary market information and makes a statement like this, it's very concerning because how could the market crash in 2020? We had just been through the biggest boom in U.S. history. If you study the history of the United States, going back to colonial days, you'll see that every turn of the century, there is a massive boom and bust. Boom and bust. We grow on, we go on. We've had ours. I mean, the cycle will continue, absolutely. But will we see that kind of thing happen again for, for the foreseeable future? I don't believe so. So when they're purporting that the housing market is gonna crash, and if you remember in 2019, the media was hard on the bandwagon of, hey, recession is around the corner. Recession's on the way, hey, you know. Every news outlet, recession's happening. Here, recession is here. It's just you haven't realized it yet, but recession is coming. Sun's not going to come up at midnight. It just doesn't go with the flow of the cycle. I'm sorry, Mr. Shores, 15 minutes went by so fast. He forgot the golden rule of real estate. Please tell me what is the golden rule of real estate? Well, I, 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 got, I wish I had some candy to throw to you. That's, a, that's absolutely true. But I kind of tend to look at it like this. Real estate is a supply and demand business. And the minute you forget that it's supply and demand, you will be in trouble. There's no question about that. So he forgot that it's supply and demand. So we must continuously remind ourselves that supply and demand. We have to continuously look at market information, data, and decide, hey, is there supply excess or demand excess? Are they in balance? We spend a whole lot of our time looking at properties, and for myself, you all from an appraisal point of view, but for myself, I look at properties and go, no, no, that won't work, no, forget that. Oh, that looks interesting. Now let's start running it down to find out more about it, if it really is an investment or not. The recovery is going to end the same way it always is. It's going to end in an expansion. And I truly believe that this expansion phase, and we've only gone into the expansion 2020, early 2021. Now, I'm not talking anything about <laughs> what happened in 2020, right? That's all, uh, you know just a blank page. However, we have to get back to economic reality. And the fact is that the recovery did go into 2020, probably, probably sometime early 2021. So where do we go from here? What do we have to start looking at? 
we have to continue about the fundamentals. New household formations, population growth, income stability and employment. That's another reason that I couldn't play back in the boom because it was not a normal equilibrium supply and demand market. It was nothing but cheap capital flowing like Niagara Falls into all core real estate assets. These are, there's, these are no secrets to you, but we have to study them continuously. Now household formations doubled up during that period of time. Everybody's living together and millennials got, were priced out of the market for property they wanted. For example, in Houston, Texas, it's central business district, followed by a loop, followed by a loop, followed by a loop. The inner loop residential properties are the most expensive. It's a typical Burgess model, right? How the city grows. They're probably putting in a new loop even as we talk. <laughs> it's continuous down there with it. My point being is they want to be there in that loop, but they're priced out. What can they do? Okay. Now, there's missing aspects to that household formation. You know, they lag behind the, the housing supply and the, the available housing supply. So they really didn't have a, a way to go or where to go because, you know, it got absorbed in 2017. 2018, household formation slightly above average. All right, if we assume the, the historical norm, 2.3 people per household, or the 2-1 split from single family housing to multifamily, you'll see that demand, demand, what's that word, demand, we need about 3.5 million in single family housing and 1.8 in additional multifamily housing. So until this deficit or these deficits are made up, then we cannot go on to the next phase of the cycle. And we'll look at you know, how income and how growth of income was able to bring about the recovery. But we're not there yet. So if you look at four to six percent historical full employment rate, that's where we were in 2019, running up to 2020. I mean, everything was looking perfect. Everything was looking perfect. Comes along the pandemic, unemployment was close to 17%. And it was only around 10% at the worst of the Great Recession. So jobs being added here, 2020, 2 million, 1.5 in 2021. Employment is the key factor. Even at this point in time, there are, more, there are more available jobs than people to fill those jobs at this point in time. So even out of the MSAs, the 46 MSAs that we, MSAs that we track, you know, you, we see this same story. Excess of pre-recession. Per capita income has increased. That's a great sign. Great sign. And real capital was very, very erratic from this period of time. Between 2010 and 16, I mean, it was never, never land. It, it was neither up, it was neither down. Nobody knew what was going on. And it was a hangover from the Great Recession and where are we going to go? What's going to happen? So it was very uh, unsteady and unstable. 
But always remember that it's employment. Employment drives the demand for all sectors of real estate. So if in income is going up, employment's going up, you can be sure that real estate assets are going to get absorbed into the market. If you look at this chart, these two things go lockstep as employment increased. It's like the hockey stick, right? Look what happens with the foreclosure rate. It goes all the way down here. It took 13 years, 13 years for those foreclosures to be absorbed back into the market. We could not get to a, rec a recovery, could not get to a recovery until until all this was absorbed back in the market. So at this point in time, foreclosures vary 0.25% of the total inventory. Um, so when we have this kind of demand going forward and population growth, those people are going to demand real estate assets, right? Through 2023. Okay. Major indice here is home equity. Some slides we want to get to a little bit better here. Um, I've been given kind of the cue that I need to kind of wrap it up. So look here, home U.S. homeowners have really won the lottery here. Now I love when my net worth goes up because my net worth is wrapped up in real estate. So when equity goes up, my wealth goes up. I'm happy. What did I say here? Oh, yeah. All right, so 2021 was when that number came in. And where are we at? It reached an all-time high in 2022. If you had any piece of property, somebody would have bought it from me if you wanted to sell it. That's what, that's what you call a supply and demand market equilibrium. That, that never, ever happens, but it happened in this brief period of time that everything brought to the market was cleared from the market. You know, if you study the classical school of economics, you know, that's why Adam Smith and all those guys, they believed that the market, you know, would clear. It never did. It took Keynes to come along and say, hey, it's never been like this. Here's how it really is. So average house is now about $300,000. You can even believe that. Now lenders, Lenders are in a very secure, secure position here because this is an LTV. LTVs are going down. So the most are, are 75 to 80 percent. Very, very, very risk averse for them. And lenders got their money back 80 percent in 2010 or 18, excuse me. Um, DCRs are back to 1.25. I saw in the Great Recession that there were DCRs of 175 for the few properties that were even trading. So it's good to be back. Okay, so projection is rates are going up. It's a visual analogy of what's happening to your money in a high inflationary period. But guess what? Monetary policy didn't cause inflation. So therefore, however well-meaning it is, it cannot fix inflation. It has to do with supply chain issues. And we all know what this is. This is economic reality. This is where we are. Now this brings about a double whammy because we do in fact have demand pull and cost push inflation. So that being said, Real estate assets are just going to continue to increase in value because inflation pushes values up, right? Because real estate assets, they hold the value and keep your purchasing power from being eroded by the ravages of, of inflation. So no recession. Why not? We're underbuilt. We're undersupplied. And... All the, if anybody wants the slides, you're welcome to see here. All the analysis has been done on it. So 
it may moderate in 23, 24, but we have a deficit. All right. I could go through all the indices, construction, uh, retail, all that, uh, but I'm getting the uh, getting the hook here to, to get going. What can I wrap it up with? So until that demand gets satisfied, you won't see a recession, especially in, in real estate markets, because real estate markets are so fractionalized, so fractionalized that no big one company or group of companies can come along and say, hey, we're going to turn the recession on now. It's not happening in real estate. So as long as there's a limited supply and effective demand, ready, willing, and able buyer, we're going to stay in the expansion phase. Uh, so we're about 1.7 million of pent up demand. After the Great Recession, that pent up demand could not get satisfied. It's finally reaching the peak of being satisfied here, probably in about 2023, 20, 24. Uh, not going to go through all the indices with you. Uh, time's not allowed, so. Household wealth is a key indicator of an, a, a hedge against inflation. The way I look at it, long run expansion is going to continue into 23, 24. Limited supply, sustained confidence in business sector, uh, though you may hear otherwise, and in the consumer sector. So given all that said, I certainly believe that we're in a long run expansion in the US economy. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure to be here to speak for you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks a lot. We really do appreciate you for coming out and spending your time with us uh, this morning. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I know Ronnie's going to probably be around here, probably up to the first break, right? And I'll be so here. Anybody who wants to talk with me, I'm here. Questions or comments or suggestions? So I had a really great experience here today listening to Ronnie. It was nice to hear someone with real data and real information. And it didn't seem like there was any direction he was being pushed into, just giving us information, which was absolutely fantastic. Thank you. I'm a member of the MAI program from Huntsville, the Symposium International. I think the timing of the Symposium has really been great uh, from everything that's going on. And our appraisal world right now, where our crystal ball is going to work all that great. Uh, but it's great to get insight from experts. Uh, and, uh, they've been doing this a long time, and it gives us, uh, it gives us a little bit of a uh, look what we need to be focusing on in the future. And I think we've seen this train start to slow down and now how do we deal with it? How is it going to affect the value? It's going to be important in the profession and the real estate world. So another interesting time for the program. Thank you. Presentation has been incredibly informative. I uh, enjoyed the networking opportunity. Uh, great time here at National. Thanks. My name is Gene Poe, and I really enjoyed the first uh, two sessions. A uh, really good synopsis on the economic, current economy and, and, and the history. Right, Ronnie did a great job today talking to us about the real estate cycle and telling us how to look for indicators on how we're coming in and out of different cycles. It was really helpful, and I'm glad that I was here to hear it. Hey there, my name is Rebecca. I just attended Ronnie's talk on the story of the market since 2001, and I found it very insightful, and I'm so happy that I came. So I